Wall of Grief and Love, the podcast. Welcome to the Wall of Grief and Love, a podcast about all things to do with the UK COVID Memorial Wall. Half a kilometer of painted red hearts that runs from Westminster Bridge to Lambeth Bridge on the South Bank in London, commemorating those who have lost their lives to COVID in the UK. Each week, we'll be telling you a story about the wall, how it began, how it's maintained, and what it means to the people whose loved ones are commemorated there. I'm Lorelai King, a volunteer at the wall, and I look forward to sharing these stories with you. Episode 1, Beginnings. As it's our first episode, we're going to learn about the history of the wall, how this unique memorial came into being. I talked to Oliver Knowles and James Sadry of Led by Donkeys, the activist group known for holding politicians to account. They, along with the COVID-bereaved Families for Justice UK, were instrumental in establishing the memorial wall. Led by Donkeys' mission statement is art, activism, accountability. Ollie and James, thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us today. We all know Led by Donkeys for your incredibly effective campaigning and activism, particularly around uh, Brexit and the promises that were made at, made at that time. Um, and a couple of years ago, you also became involved with the COVID Bereaved Families for Justice, a group to, to which I belong. And we're here today to talk about the UK National COVID Memorial Wall, which was a kind of co-production between you and uh, Cobra Brew families. How did that pairing come about? Um, well, yeah, you're right to, to to sort of reference Brexit in a way. So just to, to assume no working knowledge of Led by Donkeys for a moment, the very short version of this is the Led by Donkeys project emerged at the very beginning of 2019 when the UK was in the throes of Brexit chaos. You remember a year of uh meaningful votes and uh culminating in the general election that, that led to Boris Johnson's thumping majority. Our campaign emerged as a as an as an opposition to Brexit, but we got to the end of 2019 fairly clear in our own minds that we had a a platform that was bigger than the Brexit issue, the big popular following. At its heart the project was a a, a political accountability project, essentially, but perhaps also a vehicle for pushing forward progressive ideas and values for helping elevate the voices of groups with less campaign experience. But we went into 2020 not really knowing how to develop that, or uh, and it wasn't particularly well formulated, just an idea. And then, of course, 2020 started, and it wasn't far into 2020 when we started to get rumours of a strange new virus emerging in China, and before we knew it, the pandemic was upon us. And actually, that slightly threw our thinking. We weren't quite sure what to do with the Led by Donkeys project at that point. But it became clear pretty quickly, of course, that Johnson and Johnson's government were handling the pandemic very badly. And that's really where we started to get our eye in to the sort of second iteration of Led by Donkeys, if you like. And it was actually, it was actually after the first wave when we first made contact with COVID-19 Brief Families for Justice, and in particular to, to Joe Goodman and Matt Fowler, who were so instrumental in setting that group up. And the first thing we, we did with, was, was actually an offer of, of help. But the first thing we did with them was to gather some video testimony from them and project it onto the Houses of Parliament. This is a similar tactic that we'd use with some of the Brexit campaigning. But it was them talking about their experiences of that first wave. At that moment, they were campaigning for, I think it was a sort of a rapid review, rapid public inquiry into that first wave to learn lessons for the second. And that's kind of where the story starts, because after that intervention, we, we sort of had an ongoing conversation that wove its way through several weeks and months about how together... The, our two groups could sort of mark the scale of what had happened in the pandemic and mark the grief and, and the loss. And eventually that led to the concept of the memorial wall. But it was a long winding route to it. And I, and I think there was, um, 
there, there was uh, a marker that came down. I can't remember exactly what when it was, but there was some sort of statement from Boris Johnson that he wanted to create a memorial. And as soon as that came out, um, we thought collectively like we really need to get ahead of this because if he wants to own that space um, of trying to tell the story of obviously his mishandling of the pandemic, but then try and own and direct and coordinate the collective grief um, that the country has you know, shared and experienced, that, that felt like a step too far. So we really wanted to, together to find a way to, to create that people-led memorial that obviously had at its heart a way of memorializing and remembering people who've lost, but also have it as an accountability um, uh, instrument or tool because, um, you know, COVID brief families for justice were very much pushing for that inquiry. Um, and it felt like this could do both of those things, really. And how the idea of a mural, was that always the idea? I mean, there are two things I want to talk about that. Why a mural and and the image of the red heart, which has become so evocative and for many people is a symbol of the wall itself, the red heart. How did um, how did that come about? I mean, we 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 worked for a lot of concepts, and this com- the conversation, as I say, is a wove through the weeks and months. Actually, at the beginning, it wasn't necessarily a mural. Um, we 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 talked to all sorts of other types of intervention or build a um, uh, a big sculpture. We looked at different locations. We we walked the streets of London looking for a site. Um, I think we, you know, as James said, we 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 definitely wanted this to be in the hands of the gr- the grieving families and it felt right that it was sort of people led so very important the in terms of thinking about a concept and a site we were looking for somewhere that was you know open access that was accessible all the time by the public uh, and it, it took some time to kind of get to the wall itself i mean there was a there was a lot of sort of site wrecking and thinking about where this might work in london i think we felt london was the right place but it was Yes, it was. It was only when we sort of walked that stretch of the embankment, and actually, you know, that site worked for a number of reasons. It's actually for central London. It's it's actually relatively serene. It like actually feels like the right place for a for a memorial. It's tree lined. It's next to the river. Even though you have Westminster Bridge at one end and Lambeth the other, it feels a little bit away from the from the traffic noise. And of course, the other thing you realise when you're there is the this is sort of the political nature of the site as well. It is a, a reminder to the politicians, not just to the Johnson government, but to all the politicians who would later scrutinise how the government performed during the pandemic. There it is, facing facing Parliament. So that's that's kind of how we got to the site and to, to memorialise. We wanted something that was participative, so it needed to be somewhere people could come to make their mark. But the story of how we got to the hearts is a bit different. That also took a lot of thinking and there were lots of alternatives but I'll let James take over on that well I mean my memory's not perfect on this stuff um but we did go through a whole bunch of different ideas um both as us as the led by donkeys group and also with um uh, the cover brief families and bouncing lots of ideas uh around within the constraints of um what could we logistically pull off um at scale in a short amount of time because obviously central to this concept was that it was a people-led effort we couldn't seek permission from the same people responsible for mishandling the pandemic i mean it's like going to boris johnson and saying do we have the power to to grieve or in in the way that we like um from the man most responsible for the crisis so that, that was the core constraint how could we pull this off um in a short amount of time um while similarly, you know, what is what is the right kind of intervention and not just a symbol, but the actual act of installing the memorial that feels um, appropriate uh, and respectful for every single life lost. And that was really what we built around because you could do something quickly, but, you know, a memorial to, to 10 people. Um, you put a huge amount of effort into and a memorial to you know 150,000 people. How do you how do you think about those things and not do something in a, in a rushed way that that feels like it's not really giving the right emphasis for each individual life? And that's why we settled on this idea of of individual um, hand drawn elements 
Um, and and the heart really we we came to because uh, because of love really because obviously in a grief and love being such closely intertwined um, emotions and feelings and um, and we didn't think that could really be improved on. Um, there was a discussion around different coloured hearts because obviously there are campaign connotations for for some different coloured hearts, but um, collectively we thought really if we focus on the red heart as a symbol of love, that really gets to the you know the essence of what this memorial is about. It's about all of those individual lives lost. Um, but then just a little extra element, we we had played with this idea of trying to stencil those hearts at speed because we wanted to get this down very quickly. Um, but then again, we we that went round counter to this idea of each individual heart representing a unique life a unique individual that has unique attributes and also the practice of of painting the heart itself wanting to be a moment of reflection and a moment of respect for that individual so that's why we came down to the individual red hearts and the logistics and planning how did how did you find people to paint how did that all happen and then how did it actually go on the day <laughs> i think we we laugh because it was quite a stressful time. It was a big. It was a big project. I mean, this was this was this was the great thing about the collaborative nature of the project as well, because I think what we brought to it was our ability to sort of organise at this scale. But it absolutely needed the 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 power, I think, of Joe and Matt and the grieving families and, and friends, and that that worked very well. But it was yes, it was a you know, it was quite it was a complicated thing to organise. We so we we alighted on um, a, a plan essentially to sort of claim the site, and as James said, we didn't have permission to be there. So we we built um, a, a first morning, first day plan, which essentially had us look like we were an official operation. We we dressed the site. We took a lot of care to kind of make the activity look official very quickly so to illustrate that point we had we had these very sort of beautiful a-frame sandwich boards made which were you know, a beautiful lettering but made you know wouldn't have looked out, out of place outside a national trust cafe we had matching livery on the wall um we had candle lanterns laid beneath them it it, it looked like an official thing very quickly it looked like a a place of remembrance and in a way that made we well the, the the gamble was does does this make the operation look sort of unassailable and it and it worked very quickly it did it would have been very hard for first police officer or you know anybody else to have thrown us off the wall at that point even in the in the first hour and then then we had to start getting hearts on the wall, and that's that was the that was the big effort. So, how do we get this many hand painted hearts on on the wall? And that was a bit of an unknown quantity. How long would this take us? How many people would we need to do it? And we had maybe. And how do you do it? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, there, Ollie, but it was also like, how do you do it in a in a not entirely messy and chaotic way? And there was a right. stage before that where we spent quite a lot of time testing different materials and paint brushes and paints and and pens and yeah so anyway back back to yeah where you were no you're you're right james i mean i was fact we had friends here at the weekend and we both james and i have old concrete slabs in our garden which are the very first iterations of the memorial wall where we were testing different paints and pens and you know techniques for putting these hearts onto this concrete wall actually what we alighted on were these graffiti pens called posca pens and one of the elements of the operation that was quite hidden was, first of all, having to buy pretty much every Posca pen in the UK. So there was a huge effort to buy thousands of these pens from different suppliers, providers, shops across the country, then pull them together into one place. And actually, behind the scenes of the Memorial Wall was a, a flat that we rented, an Airbnb flat just on the Lambeth Road, which was kind of our logistical HQ, which looked like a Posca pen depot and was full of you know all sorts of bits of kit and equipment where we sort of staged staged the operation but the post pens really worked but what you know the, the challenge was getting all these hearts onto the wall we had no idea really how long this would take after that initial morning and we started to make 
some calculations based on having, I don't know, James, was it sort of something like 40 or 50 volunteers on that first day, but not many more. And we realised then, I'll let you take this bit, James, we, we really had to scale up. And that was where um, we we sort of put out an appeal for other members of the public and other families to come in and help us. Yeah, I, I think scale is is really at the heart of this concept and installation. I mean, when we were trying to model how how can you get you know one hundred and fifty thousand parts on that stretch of wall, um, you're dealing with calculations that you just can't obviously do in your head, and you're figuring out look, if, if a heart is roughly this size and it roughly covers this amount of wall. Um, so there's a lots of different variables going on, but we did a bit of computer modeling and. And figured out that if we had roughly hand hand sized hearts, we you know we'd be able to fit them all in there. Um, but yes, as Ollie said, that first day of installation, uh, we really realised we needed to ramp up very quickly, and that's when we put out the public call for volunteers, and we had an overwhelming response. And then we had essentially like a rolling uh, training and briefing session. It was hour long slots. People were signing up. I think at the end we had fifteen hundred volunteers who were signing up for for. For, for slots of time, I think it was two to three hours is what we were aiming for. And obviously, this was this was socially distanced along a wall as well. So we wanted uh, people to be, um, you know, along numbered sections so they didn't get too um, uh, kind of crowded up. Um, um, and so we were training them up very quickly on how to use these pens, a little bit of technique involved. Um, we wanted to brief them critically on what they should be thinking about as they as they kind of help install the memorial, because this wasn't just a paint job. We, it's absolutely critical that people think about those who've been lost as they paint these hearts. And that, I think, was part of the magical element of it, is you really did get a sense that it, the installation was full of this respect and dignity. Um, and there were so many stories of both um, you know, family members and other members of the public who, who felt that was a really, really key part of what made it special. Oh, that's made me a bit emotional. <laughs> that's beautiful. There was an interesting thing. I mean, I I was lucky enough not to lose anybody from COVID. And I have to say, when I was the, the week or two before the wall and then being at the wall for the first couple of days, I was there. I was project managing. I was like, we've got to just get the hearts on the wall. And it was very, for me, it was very much a, a it, it was a logistical operation and not an emotional operation. And, you know, how do we get at that point 150,000 hearts on just under half a kilometre of wall? But something happened around about the second morning, the second lunchtime, which is that it, the wall changed from being a paper plan and a logistical operation to to a place of remembrance and and grief. And I, I mean, I, I feel emotional thinking about it, but. Um, it became apparent that people were starting to come to the wall to 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 put their mark up and to grieve. And what you saw over the following ten days, and we were we were there for ten days putting this thing up, were families, um, young and old friends, coming to put their heart on the wall. And actually, because of where we'd been, which was largely locked down, many people having their first moment of sort of public grief and and expressing something in a public space and there was a there was a lot of grief there there were a lot of tears and and people embracing people and people bought bottles of carver or champagne to have a moment and mark somebody and the wall went from being as i say this paper operation to something very very different and very special and that's where i felt i mean i i remember seeing that grief and it was it was it it was it was something to see and to behold but it 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 really felt like the wall was beginning to 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 sort of resonate and mean something and that underscored all the you know all the work that had gone into it was absolutely worthwhile it was such a logistical lift and we were working like with with quite little sleep to coordinate this slightly amorphous operation and obviously it being a a memorial we wanted it to have a level of of um i guess uh artistic quality and we didn't want it to um so there's a huge amount of effort to make sure this was installed properly but occasionally i mean i i'd, I'd say it was probably 
twice a day I would step out of that logistical role and and walk along the wall and and engage with what it represented and that was a deeply emotional experience and it's it's it's, it's quite emotional to even talk about it but um uh I remember I remember so many different conversations and, and little glimpses of of people who'd walk along and, and and have their moment but people often ask and say you know didn't you get a police response because obviously this was a this was a listed wall in central london and it's potentially an act of criminal damage um didn't you get any police come and try and stop you <laughs> and i always say there was, there was one police interaction i had and that was a bunch of police officers who were sitting above the wall because above the wall you could get into um st thomas's hospital there who were waiting for um a vaccination um drive and uh he leaned over and caught my eye and I was like, okay, here we go. His like first police interaction. I hadn't realized he was there with that group. And he said, um, you know, can you do me a favor, mate? I was like, sure. What do you want? He was like, um, you know, can you put a name on a harp for me? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I can, you know, who's it for? Um, and he told me it was for his, his elderly neighbor who died from COVID. And, you know, he was, he was the only person who, who would go and kind of visit her and, and check in on her and look after her. And, um, it was, it was, yeah, it was one of many, many beautiful moments. And I really felt that the wall just brought together the very best of, you know, the national community going through this period of grief. Do you have the chance to see the wall often now? And how does it make you feel? You know, we see it, it's so often the backdrop all around the world on news reports <laughs> or whatever. And how do you feel seeing it now? Ollie, I'll ask you um, first. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... I mean, I, I think it's great that it has, has essentially become the the picture that illustrates the pandemic and 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 the loss. And as you as you'll know, Laurie, going through the 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 COVID inquiry now, it's sort of it's sort of the picture that that illustrates the the inquiry as well. I think that's great, uh, and I think it you know for us, we always wanted it to be a sort of a living memorial. If that is not um an oxymoron it, 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 it's got to be used and and seen and 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 i think that it's you know it's it, it's going to stay relevant and important to very many people for a very long time and you know to see that happen is great is very very rewarding um i like the idea that there are yeah it's there for for people who've didn't just lose people um you know in the uk but it's all of the international visitors that pass it as well and have a place to go and remember and reflect and i guess to finish on this it's you know it it does have that political component it feels absolutely right that it faces parliament that it faces members of a government that so disastrously got the handling of the pandemic wrong and and that feels that feels very right. If I, you know, I, I think the, the the placing of it was was super important, and we'll we'll keep it relevant for years to come. And James, if I could ask you the same question, what is it like seeing it now, seeing it so much? Yeah, I I, I don't live in London now, but every time I I go to London, I I try and find the time to go down to the wall. Um, I, I feel overwhelmed w w when I go there. Um, and immensely proud that, you know, I played a, a, a minor role in making it happen because I think the, the proudest element of it all, and we talked about this when we first started the project, um, or this element of it was, um, yes, we'd love to have a role in creating a living memorial, but if it's to work and if it's to really succeed, it's, it's not really the wall, it's the community that will come around around the wall that will be truly transformative and seeing that succeed and coming to you know the annual um anniversary of it, of it being installed or the, or the walks onto downing street or all these elements or, or the fridays when when people get together to restore it um or even you know this podcast happening is, is all of all these different elements of, of testimony to this thing has worked as a, truly a living memorial and it's it's the wall in itself is, is deeply moving and a beautiful thing. Um, but all these other elements of it are, are things that just make me so, so proud of having been part of it. And the last question, uh, James, uh, for both of you, but James, what, what do you hope for for the future of the wall? As you know, we 
we have been visited by the Commemoration Commission and we're hoping for the wall to be made permanent. That's our wish. That's absolutely my wish, but it, it feels so obvious and and realistic that it almost shouldn't be a wish. I'd be astounded if it doesn't happen. I mean, seeing all of these plans for, for big national memorials um, come and go and, and what you and the team have created and, and continued to keep alive is so clearly the leading national memorial, and I would say leading international memorial to, to this pandemic, um, that it's just obvious it should be made permanent and all your efforts supported. And Ollie? Yeah, couldn't agree more. It, I, and I, th- I think it will happen. And, I, um, you know, it's it's been interesting that to see the, the journey that the kind of media and commentators have made with the wall from being slightly dismissive of it through to now using it in all of their stories about the inquiry and it's referred to as the national covid memorial wall and that's in no small part i think to the work that you know you and your team have put into restoring it and keeping it looking beautiful and um it absolutely it should be permanent but i have i have very little doubt that that will happen i think it's i think it's there i i think it's sort of an unassailable thing now and it's there in all its kind of colorful and you know as i say slightly chaotic beauty it's not a perfect thing it's the hearts are imperfect and there are bits that are messy and that's exactly what it should be and i think that's great let's keep that thank you and i just wanted to say to both of you um how much the wall means to so many people i wish you could know the kind of emails we get and many people who don't have a, a, who either couldn't afford or couldn't get a permanent grave for example, that is their grave. And it just means so much. And the emotion at the wall to this day when people come to visit their heart is really something. And and we're all so grateful to you both for, for having started that off. And I'm so grateful that you came to talk to us on our very first episode thank of our podcast. You. So thank you both. Thank you so much. An That's an absolute so lovely pleasure. So that's it, our first podcast. Next week, we'll be continuing with the story of the wall's beginnings, talking to some of the people who were there at the start. We hope you'll tune in. And if you're in London, we hope that you'll come visit the Memorial Wall. I promise you it will be a special experience. In the meantime, you can visit us online at nationalcovidmemorialwall.org or follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Threads. If you have a loved one who died in the UK with COVID on their death certificate and would like a heart to be dedicated to them, message us on our Facebook page, The Wall of Grief and Love, or email us at covidmemorialwall at gmail.com. Till next time. Wall of Grief and Love, the podcast, was written and presented by me, Lorelai King. Today's participants were Oliver Knowles and James Sadry of Led by Donkeys. Post-production is by Ross Berman. Original music is by Roger Planer and John McBurney. This is a Friends of the Wall production. <laughs>